Hello, flight instructors and NAFI members. John Niehaus, Director of Program Development for the National Association of Flight Instructors, welcoming you back to another episode of the NAFI More Right Rudder Podcast, the podcast for flight instructors on the go. And I'd like to start this presentation out or this podcast out with a simple thank you. Thank you to all of you that listen. Thank you for all of the members out there, the flight instructors, uh, member or not, for everything that you do and the contributions that you make to not just the flight instruction profession, but just the safety of aviation. Flight instructors are the gatekeepers for safe pilots. Everything comes through us, whether it's a change in the way things need to be taught or just the idea that we sharpen the pencil that is the general pilot and make them better and keep them better. So we thank you for everything that you do. And on top of that, if you came to the first ever NAFI Summit last week, I send an extra special thanks because you never know what to expect when you have a first ever event. And it was wonderful. Um, It was a three-day event, starting with a networking event on the first day, networking sort of hors d'oeuvres dinner, if you want to call it that, and then two full days and an additional dinner of presentations and a meet and greet with John and Martha King and the NAFI team and a whole bunch of other wonderful instructors and exhibitors. We had some some supporters come and uh, meet and greet with members and and just talk and, and have wonderful conversations. So it was a great event. If you weren't able to make it, the presentations were recorded professionally and should be available for distribution in the near future. And what format that takes, we haven't quite figured it out yet, or at least no one's told me yet. So um, we'll get there, but uh, look for that in the coming future. And you can kind of live vicariously through that, and, and maybe that might convince you into joining us next year, because if you didn't hear, the announcement has been made that we're going to do it again. So um, look for more information on that regard. But uh, it was very exciting, and we appreciate everybody who contributed to just a, a fantastic three days. Now, with that said, um, one of the other amazing things that came out of the event is I talked to a lot of people. And my big idea for kind of a lot of the things that I do here at NAFI, this podcast included, is making this an outlet for sharing stories, sharing techniques, sharing things from the average flight instructor. You know, it's so often we think that all of this information needs to come from well-known names, the, the John and Martha Kings of the world and the sporties and the ASAs of the world and the, the other sort of well-known entities. And, and while they're all great, I'm not disparaging anybody, um, there's also plenty to be learned from the lesser-known people, the, the people who are out there doing the job every day. And I got to talk to a lot of instructors who live this life, and we got a lot of ideas. I got a lot of people that are willing to come on and share their ideas, and really that's what NAFI is all about. You know, I've said it before that NAFI is sort of the container, um, and the members are sort of all of the ideas that go into that container, and, and we want to use our platform as a way to raise up these people, and if we can sort of help you get uh, some notoriety and, and share your story with the world, then we've done our jobs. So look for some some really good, unique content on this podcast coming out shortly. I always feel bad when we use a lot of the pre-recorded content, which we've done recently, and some of that is just uh, because it's good stuff, and some of it is because, you know, there's just, uh, at least leading up to the summit, there was a lot going on. So I do hope that you have enjoyed that stuff, and I do have one more for you. Um, this is actually the, the presentation we're going to listen to today is one done by a board member of ours, Greg Feith. You may have heard him um, on some of the uh, Discovery Channel shows he's done or the uh, uh, podcast that he's on, and uh, I think you'll enjoy what he has to say. But it's, is your defensive flying offensive? And uh, the synopsis for the course is it just it provides a different perspective about aviation safety and how your actions in aviation could be a life lesson. 
and how a lot of those life lessons contribute towards aviation safety. Um, Greg says that he hopes this empowers the learner to understand that aviation safety is a core value and that hazard identification and mitigation is not a job, but a continuing adventure. So I think you're going to find that there's some good stuff in here. And uh, Greg is the guy to listen to uh, about this topic because he's just so well versed in, in what he does. So once again, Thank you for everything. If you haven't subscribed, if you haven't told your friends about the podcast or about some of the different other outlets we have, like our YouTube channel, social media channels, and stuff like that, please do that. It every little bit helps. And uh, the more we can get the word out, the more of these awesome presentations we can do. So without any further ado, is your defensive flying offensive with Greg Fike? So Greg has over 40 years of accident investigation history. More than 20 of that, actually 22, I believe, was with the NTSB itself. He was a, honored as a distinguished Embry-Riddle alumni, as well as other awards that he's received from various organizations. He co-hosts a weekly podcast. So in case you like to listen to podcasts, there's a good one for you, Flight Safety Detective. He's also a co-inventor of a specialized uh, safety device to help children less than 24 months stay safe in aircraft. Even though we know technically by regulation they can be held on a lap, that's not always the best place for them, you know, without any other type of restraint. Uh, you can also, he's going to look very familiar to many of you because you can find him regularly on television programs as guest presenters and hosts. Uh, in fact, you can see looking at these, like why airplanes crash, seconds to disaster, that helps us explain his nickname, which is Crash Fife. Okay. He also is an aviation safety analyst for NBC News and relating to his work on the Malaysian aircraft disaster, he is a National Emmy Award winner. Okay. So having learned quite a bit about Greg here, a little bit about Greg, let's turn it over to him and start learning what he has to tell us. This is good, very important information. Okay, over to you, Greg. Thank you, Karen. It's great to be here, and I'm glad that uh, we have uh, all of you out there watching this Mentor Live. It's a valuable program, and as a board member at NAFI, uh, safety, of course, is always a topic in all of our meetings and, of course, a fundamental function of this organization, not only to make flight instructors better, to, but to make us all better. So with this presentation tonight, what I want to do is walk you through the art of making your defensive flying not so much offensive, because one of the things that we look at, of course, as an accident investigator is the fact that it's my job to dissect your performance if you are involved in any kind of serious incident or accident. And of course, not knowing who you are, only having the facts, conditions, and circumstances, I've now got to make a determination whether or not you were doing those things that a prudent pilot, that is not the Chuck Yeager type pilots and not the lowest of low pilots, but that baseline, that prudent pilot would do. And working for the National Transportation Safety Board, and of course, I always made some fun of that because people go, oh my gosh, you're with the NTSB. Yeah, well, that's the North Texas State Band, you know. You had to break the ice to get them relaxed because anytime a Fed shows up and starts asking questions about a, <laughs> a person's performance, everybody goes into the defensive mode. So um, it's all about accident investigation not to impugn or indict anybody or, of course, give any ammunition to the FAA so that they can take some sort of action against you. But rather, accident investigation is all about learning lessons from these events 
so that, of course, we can enhance aviation safety. That's what it's all about. I do it because it's my profession as far as accident investigation and aviation safety. But as I preach all the time, we are all in some form or fashion safety professionals. It's, I mean, I just do it full time so that we can, we can enhance safety. But you are a safety professional as well, because not only are you teaching as an instructor, but as a pilot, you are also probably mentoring other people. You, of course, have passengers who fly with you who have a tacit trust in everything you do. They believe that you know what you're doing. And unfortunately, my job results from people that don't make the right decision or are flying a piece of equipment that shouldn't be in the air. And we're going to get into that in this presentation. But one of the first things I always hear is, is aviation safe? Well, that's a very generic loaded question because those of us that are in the business, and I call it fly it, fix it, or manage it. That is pilots who fly it, mechanics who fix it. And then of course, managers, that is flight department managers, airlines, um, even yourself, because you have to manage your own aircraft if you do operate your own aircraft. So whether you fly it, fix it, or manage it, one of the things that I always hear about is, is aviation safe? And it it is a relative term because you have to separate commercial aviation out of general aviation. You cannot use that generic term. It's kind of like, are the are people that drive cars every day to go to work and go to the grocery store as safe as commercial truck drivers, commercial bus drivers, commercial limousine drivers? Well, that's a that's two different echelons because you have a person who has to meet a particular standard to have a CDL license. They are professional drivers, just like professional pilots. And then you have the general aviation pilots, which are more along the line of the everyday person who drives their car. And so some of the statistics that you hear are kind of uh, obscured, if you will. They're kind of distorted. Um, Of course, the number that we always hear about is, well, 80% 80 of the accidents are caused by pilot error. That's not true. Um, And in fact, when you look at accidents as a whole, you can actually say, that any serious incident or accident is 100% human caused in some way, shape, or form. And people go, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean 100%? The human designed the aircraft. The human built the aircraft. The human maintained the aircraft. The human operated the aircraft. So even if you have an engine that fails and it's a mechanical malfunction, My job is to determine why that engine failed. Well, if it was a poorly designed fan blade, that's human. If it was a materials problem, that's human. And so you can actually say that any event that takes place is 100% human caused. And if you look at the statistics from the NTSB, they kind of break it down that 80% of the events that take place, the accidents and incidents that take place are uh, 80% are human caused and about 20% are mechanical in some form or fashion. So the numbers, you have to ferret out the details in those numbers and some of them can be misleading. So with this presentation, I wanna try and separate some of those facts from fiction ideas that are out there. And then of course, give you my perspective When I look at accident investigation, and I've been blessed to have a great career starting at a very early age, one of the things that I look at now and I really preach is the fact that everything we do in aviation is a life lesson. And everything we do in life is a flying lesson. And I'll try and relate that so that you understand it. We are not reinventing the wheel here. Everything we do to be safe in an aircraft You do every day in your life, whether it's crossing the street, driving your car, or identifying hazards within your own home or your office to mitigate or eliminate some sort of serious event or accident. So when you look at the question of, is aviation safe? Everything has to be kept in context. And that's the biggest concern that we have in our industry is keeping things in context. 
Now, of course, we hear this, this term, safety, 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 safety. I walk out the door and my family says, fly safe today. You walk out the door, they say, be careful, fly safe. Don't get hurt. Watch yourself. I have every intent to go out, fly the airplane, come back, and come home in one piece, as all of you do. And so we hear this safety message preached all the time. We're reminded of it all the time. And there's a lot of times where it's enough already. I know to be safe. I'm not going to do anything unsafe. I'm not going to make bad decisions. Um, Yeah, that accident happened, but that can't happen to me. Well, a lot of times, just like when we're teaching kids, they'll start to tune you out. Well, pilots, mechanics, managers, they get, they get tired of that same term, and they will start to tune out that term safety. I don't mind being reminded because I've got so many other things that are on my mind. That knocks me back to reality, and it should knock you back to reality. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't push back on when people say or your colleagues or your peer group say, you know what, you might want to check the weather one more time because it's a safety issue. Or, you know, we're not questioning your skills, abilities, and knowledge, but we want you to be safe. Don't take offense to that, but you should embrace it. Why? Because as pilots, we have a great responsibility that I'll talk about here in a minute. So when you look at the term safety, this is what it means. It's about controlling and recognizing hazards and then mitigating or eliminating those things that could present themselves is a challenge to us in our particular skills, abilities, and knowledge. And the last thing we want is to have all of these things culminate where we're trying to mitigate or eliminate multiple challenges on a single flight. One of the things that I believe is that safety has to be a core value. You can't have safety as a job because anytime it becomes a job, all of a sudden now it becomes a burden. You constantly have to think about it. But safety should be a core value. I know that I can walk into the kitchen and see a knife on the drawer or on the countertop and recognize that instantly as a hazard, not necessarily to me, but to my family, because they don't see the world the same way I see it from a safety perspective. I get to the hangar. I see that puddle of water on the hangar floor. It doesn't look like much, but I recognize that puddle of water instantly as a slip trip hazard. We all know that a lot of the hangar floors are epoxy coated, so it becomes very slippery. I can immediately recognize that, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to mitigate or eliminate that. Mop it up, clean it up, throw a rag on it or something, so that some I can identify it to those people that don't see the world the same way. And you should do the same thing. Because that is what risk management all, is all about. If it's a core value, you don't have to make it a job. Things are just going to instantly pop when you see them or the potential for them. A plug that's hanging off of a, a, a receptacle and things like that. The other end of it is an open-ended plug. You know that if it's right there next to that puddle of water, it could be a problem. That's the way we have to see the world. And that's what we try to train, not only flight instructors training students, but the industry as a whole. Again, whether you fly it, fix it, or manage it, safety management is all about identifying those risks and then finding the appropriate corrective actions. And I'll, I'll show you here in a second. But again, people have their own ideas of what safety is all about. Of course, the old approach to safety is, you know, I don't care what you do to get the job done or self-induced pressure. I'm, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this trip planned and flown because I only have five days of vacation with my family. So I'm going to make it happen and I'm going to try and do it, not only from the safety perspective, but I'm going to try and do so I don't embarrass myself. And really, when you look at this first statement, I don't care what it takes to get the flight completed. Just don't screw it up. Well, that puts a lot of pressure on a pilot, especially especially a general aviation pilot. Commercial pilots have that same particular self-induced pressure, especially in the environments that they fly in, charter pilots or a corporate pilot, where the boss expects you to get the job done. You have a hundred, you know, you have a hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year salary, and you're flying a, a twenty or thirty million dollar jet. 
I expect you to be able to get me from point A to point B. That puts a lot of pressure on a pilot or a crew to accomplish the mission. Of course, the other part of it is, you know, the old thinking was reactive. Uh, We're not going to do anything or change anything until something happens, and then we're going to take corrective action. That's the wrong way to think about the world, because I worked for a, a reactive agency. I worked for the National Transportation Safety Board. We responded to serious incidents and accidents. The facts, conditions, and circumstances that we found, the lessons learned, were the proactive part through safety recommendations and changes to make aviation safer. But the NTSB is a reactive agency with a proactive mission statement to improve aviation safety. And while that's okay, and you need to have both of those, you need to be reactive. You got to understand what's going on to have caused that accident, but you also have to be very proactive. And you want to be more proactive so that you don't have to be reactive. I don't want to have to go out there and investigate accidents. I'd rather try to identify the potential for issues before somebody is seriously injured or, of course, killed. And then finally, it's easy to point the finger and blame everybody else. The hardest thing, and I see it all the time when I'm interviewing pilots or mechanics or even managers, and that is, well, the FAA did this or the FAA made me do this or the company made me do this or they didn't give me this information. Who's the infamous they? Well, it's someone else. So it's real easy to to point the finger somewhere else. The hardest part is to look at yourself in the mirror and point the finger at yourself because you are and possibly were the problem or at least part of the problem. And these are the things that as an accident investigator, I've got to try to identify Where is this sequence of events? Where is this chain of events? It's never just one thing. Yeah, you can say the pilot flew VFR into IMC. That's only one part of a very long chain of events. How did the actual flight start? Was the planning poor? Was the training poor? Were they properly qualified to put themselves in a position? And then, of course, the end result was spatial disorientation or some other factor that led to the loss of the aircraft and possibly a loss of life. When we look at safety, you have to look at it from a proactive safety approach. And that is, I always preach that the most flexible and adaptable machine in an aircraft, a car, or anything else is the human. Because we can process so much information in a very short period of time and make decisions, execute those decisions, evaluate them, and then react to whatever comes along. And if you look at the miracle on the Hudson with Sully Sullenberger and, of course, Jeff Skiles, they didn't have a lot of input other than they knew that their aircraft performance wasn't going to allow them to get back to a piece of pavement, whether it was in New Jersey to Teterboro, back to LaGuardia. And they made the commitment and then executed that commitment to landing in the um, in the Hudson River. Now, Take those two pilots out and make that an autonomous machine. Make it a computer flying that. Would the outcome have been the same? Would the computer have determined that the best place to put that aircraft down would have been in the river? That's something for you to think about. So when we look at errors, we have to look at the fact of whether or not we can identify those errors before they actually occur. And if you look at this slide, Errors are not deterministic. That is, you can't predict when an error is going to happen. We try to do that, um, but again, you can't predict a particular error. But more than likely, because of statistics and because of history, it's probabilistic. That is, we know that periodically, you know, taking the the um, uh, factors that we've learned in other accidents, the lessons learned. We can come up with trends. So we know what kind of environments, we know what conditions, we know what qualifications could put pilots or mechanics or even managers in positions that could jeopardize the safety of flight. So statistics, again, they're great tools, but they can be misleading if they are not used properly. And one of the things that we're trying to do, as many of you know, the articles that have been written, a lot of the podcasts, and of course, some of the YouTube 
videos and what the FAA is working on and as us as flight instructors are trying to preach is loss of control. Why are we having so many loss of control events, not only with general aviation pilots, but even through the commercial airline ranks? So what is the question and what is the answer? And it's not one thing that we can put our hands on. We can have all the statistics in the world, but we still haven't been able to find a reasonable and workable solution to prevent loss of control accidents. Now, if you go retro, you go back and you look at this. I I have this particular saying in my office. I think it's very appropriate to everything we do in life. And that is carelessness and overconfidence are more dangerous than deliberately accepted risk. And when you really think about that and dissect it, if you just go off haphazard and just do things without really thinking through the consequences, you're going to find the place that you don't want to be in. And especially if you do that in an aircraft. However, we know that aviation is a high risk event. And what we try to do is we try to mitigate that risk to as close to zero as possible. So we are taking a a deliberate risk, but we are trying to utilize all the tools, not only our own personal skills, abilities, and knowledge, but we're utilizing all the tools available to us, whether it's through flight service and getting great weather briefings, DUOT, or any of the four flights or anything else where they give you so much information. Of course, we're taking our own personal backgrounds with the training. And then, of course, with all the new generation automation in these aircraft, not only in general aviation, but of course, commercial aviation, we have all of these tools available to us to try to mitigate or eliminate that risk. That's why this is so valuable. And if you look at when Wilbur said this in 1901, that, you know, that was pretty philosophical because they really hadn't started flying yet. They were building things, they were testing things, but they really hadn't started flying. The problem comes seven years later when those same Wright brothers were the people that killed the, the first person in powered flight, and that was Thomas Selfridge, because they talked the talk, but they didn't walk the walk in this particular instance. They were trying to get a contract. If many of you remember some of the history of, of this particular flight, they were working to get a military contract. They had to demonstrate that they could fly the aircrafts or, for a, a certain period of time. They wanted to have a certain speed based on uh, the contractual requirements. They put two new props on the aircraft the night before. They didn't have a chance to test fly them. One was out of balance. And after they were in the air with Thomas Selfridge as a passenger, one of those props got out of balance, got into the uh, rudder baiter guy wires, and they ended up losing control of the aircraft. And, of course, it crashed and Selfridge was killed. You have to do, excuse me, <clears throat> you have to do the right thing, even when nobody's looking. And shortcutting a checklist or I'm in a hurry, so I don't really need to go down there and sump the fuel. Those are the little things that cause incidents and accidents. Those are the unexpected things. And I'll talk about the difference between surprise and startle factor. There's a big difference. People tend to throw the term out, well, he was startled or she was startled. Well, no, there are events where, yeah, it's a surprise. I wasn't expecting that, but I've got things under control and I can handle it versus a startling event where the engine comes unglued on the front of the airplane, and now you have controllability issues. That's a startle factor. So we're going to talk about those as well. But when you look at the cycle of uh, errors, we have to mitigate or eliminate the hazards that are involved in aviation, in our own personal flying, so that we don't have an ugly flight. So let me give you the cycle. Of course, you always have the problem or the issue, or the proactive mindset of let's identify the risks. That's why FRATs and FRAMPs are there. Those are those flight risk assessment tools that we should all be using in some form or fashion because it helps us at least quantify and qualify what are some of the risks that I'm going to run into during the course of my flight. So, of course, we're going to identify those risks. The next part of it is we have to evaluate that risk. Is this something that I have to be concerned with now? Is it something that I have to be concerned with later on? Is it something that in flight, 
this needs immediate action or do I have time to take some time to understand and assimilate before I take some sort of corrective action? Of course, then the next part of it is determine the appropriate corrective action to either mitigate or eliminate the risk. There are going to be times where you can't eliminate the risk, but you can minimize it or mitigate it so that you can sec- successfully get the aircraft on the ground in an emergency situation. So you're going to take that corrective action. And then, of course, you're going to evaluate to see if that corrective action was appropriate. Here's the problem. This is where a lot of people stop. They figure, OK, I took the corrective action. It seems to be working. I'm good to go. Well, guess what? That corrective action has only taken this particular event, the immediacy of this event, and mitigated it or eliminated. But that corrective action could have created some sort of hazard that is unforeseen. So the last step here is to identify the potential for a new risk based on your corrective actions. I think that's a really important uh, point, Greg, and as much as many of us are familiar with the, the cycle, the way you laid it out, uh, and in fact, I'm a safety officer and a major in the Civil Air Patrol, and safety is a core value, not only in the flying activities, but all the activities. We actually complete this cycle, operational risk matrix, and analyze this. But the last point, which you brought out, is something that doesn't always happen, is very true, because we when you modify things, you're always establishing different set of circumstances, which then need to be reevaluated. So it's quite a loop. It should be a continuous loop of risk management and mitigation, and not just a one-time event. Such as in aviation, we don't just analyze our risk before we fly, but we should be doing it throughout the entire flight. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, we have to be doing that because the environment is constantly changing, even on a VFR day with not a cloud in the sky. Um, that you never know. It's so dynamic. And, and that's what we all have to be reminded of is that it's very dynamic. And as the pilot in command, as the federal aviation regulations require, we have a lot of responsibility as the PIC. You can't put this off on anybody else. You are in command and control of the decision making and, of course, the operation of that aircraft. And then, of course, that, that the operation of the aircraft by the FAA standard says that you will operate it in a manner so as to not create a hazard to yourself or anyone else, whether they're in the aircraft or on the ground. And when you look at the great responsibility, Spider-Man, you know, with the power comes great responsibility. Well, guess what? Is the PIC, you have a lot of responsibility because you have a great amount of power. And when you think about all the things, now I tried to do that. I put, this is a very busy slide. When you start thinking about all the responsibilities you have as a a pilot in command, you know, these are just some of it. I could have gone on and written three or four more slides of all the things that I could think about. And when you start looking at it on paper like this and processing this information, at points it can be very overwhelming. And we know that as student pilots, we all went through that uh, overwhelming period. And, of course, with our flight instructors calming us down, getting us to think and process the information, or you're learning how to fly a new aircraft, stepping up to something that's more high performance, it's that transition period that can be overwhelming. Yet, again, you can't shirk that responsibility as the pilot in command because you are the responsible authority for making that aircraft operate and operate safely. So there is great expectation. So what goes into a pilot in command? Who is that person? And everything I'm talking about because it's flight related does apply to the guy fixing or the gal fixing the aircraft, fly it, fix it, or manage it. So what are the characteristics that I think make those uh, a good pilot, a good mechanic, or even a good manager in aviation? Um, they should exude or at least have as far as um, as far as conducting their particular expertise or uh, niche in the market. That is, one, you have to have character. Not, I mean, yeah, people say I'm, I am a character sometimes, but it's all about character. That is, you have to have that skill set. You have to be able to say yes when you can say yes and no when you should say no. You shouldn't flex. You should have your own standards. 
you should be a person that will be able to mentor other people. You don't have to be a flight instructor to be a mentor. And I'm going to talk about that later on as well. But it's all about your character. It's who you are. Because people, when you say, I'm a pilot, and if they start talking to you and you go, oh, yeah, you know, that weather isn't that bad. I can make it happen. I can fly through that. That all of a sudden, that all of a sudden sets your character. Like, okay, he's a risk taker. I'm not going to go flying with him. It sounds like they'll make bad decisions or he'll make bad decisions. Uh, so excuse, me just, yep, excuse me for just a moment, Crash. I'd like to make a, a quick note to our audience. Uh, as you're aware, we're about halfway through the time allotment at this point, And Greg has a lot of content to cover yet. So we'll be holding questions until the end of his presentation. But we certainly will get to your questions. Okay, Thank back you, to you, Greg. Thank you. The next part of it, as I see it, is accountability. We have to be accountable. We are not infallible. So you will, you will make mistakes. I've made mistakes. You miss a radio call. Air traffic is trying to call you three or four times. It's a mistake. Okay, you caught it. It didn't cause any incident or accident. But you have to be accountable. You have to do a self-diagnosis of what it was that caused you to miss that radio call. Were you distracted? Were you dealing with a passenger? Were you dealing with reprogramming the GPS or whatever? So again, it's all about accountable. You, can, it's not. It is not an ego deflator, and it is not uh, something that you shouldn't be able to say. You know what? I didn't do that well on this particular flight, and in fact, I may have even screwed up. It's my fault. I'm going to change my behavior. I'm going to change the way I do business. I'm going to do things in a better way. But you got to be accountable. Just because something happened, it's not someone else's fault. It usually starts with that person in the cockpit, under the wing, or in the office of the manager. Integrity. All about integrity. And every one of us has a different definition of integrity. But the bottom line here in aviation is, again, you got to do the right thing even when nobody's looking. Because if something does happen and a guy like me comes out and dissects your performance, I'm going to tell, I'm going to challenge that integrity. Did you do what you said you were going to do? Did you talk the talk, but you didn't walk the walk? So integrity is a big, big characteristic of what I believe a PIC or a, a, a maintenance technician or a manager should have. Finally, it's about responsibility. We have a responsibility to ourselves. We have a responsibility to our passengers. As a mechanic, I have a responsibility to a pilot. I have a responsibility possibly to the airline or the organization I'm working for, and of course, management. But again, you have a responsibility to the general public because if your aircraft has a problem, comes down in a neighborhood, now you've threatened the safety of people on the ground. But you have to be responsible. And again, if you know that the airplane is sick, you have questions about the airworthiness, you leave the airplane on the ground. I'm working too many accidents with unairworthy aircraft that have been involved in accidents and incidents most recently, especially coming out of maintenance. So the best way to remember these four items is care, character, accountability, integrity, and responsibility. We talk about human factors. Human factors is a very generic term. And what does human factors mean? Well, you know, there are factors of, <laughs> involved in humans. Yes, there are. And there are humans that have factors. And human factors cause accidents and incidents. But human factors also identify, mitigate, and eliminate risks that can cause accidents. So what is human factors? Well, I could present a whole day course on just what human factors are. But when we look at it from a human standpoint, and of course, a life lesson, each one of us, when they go, Greg's in his own little world, or Karen's in her own little world, or John's in his own little world, we are, because we have created our own little world. We have built the rules in our own little world based on our personal skills, abilities, knowledge, our upbringing, and a variety of other things. We've built that world. We've built the rules for that world. And then we put a 30 micron filter around that. And if you don't like Greg, then when I'm talking to you and you don't like me, you're not going to let me into your world. 
you're going to keep me at that 30 micron filter and you're not going to deal with me anymore. But if you like me, you're going to allow me to pass through that 30 micron filter and come into your world. Now the question is, you and I are paired together in the cockpit of an airplane. You have your rules in your little world. I have my rules in my little world. Whose rules win, especially if we don't like each other and we aren't letting each other into our own respective little world? Well, we have to work as a crew. How do you break that down? Well, if people you know, talk about CRM or crew resource management, and a lot of times they only apply it to a crewed airplane. Well, guess what? I try to apply it to a flight instructor and a student because I think good CRM practices between a flight instructor and a student are uh, imperative to make sure that the student is learning, the flight instructor is teaching, and that you are both communicating so that the outcome is successful. We set too many people up, whether it's a student setting up a flight instructor or vice versa, for failure. Why? Miscommunication, misunderstanding, lack of understanding. Um, there, we, we all learn and teach different ways. So when we look at paradigm filtering is what I call it, we have created our own little perfect world. In that paradigm, we've set the rules. Now, here's the, here's the problem. I've set the rules. I'm going into Aspen on a dark and stormy night. It happens to be my home airport. I'm not worried about it. Been in this situation a number of times before. You know that you shouldn't be doing it because the weather is bad. You got mountains on both sides. Yeah, I've gotten away with it one time, maybe two times. But we will rationalize or justify or just have an ignorance to those are the risks. I'm not worried about it. I'm going to continue on. Well, you may get away with it the first time. You may even get away with it a second time. Third time is usually a charm because there are so many of these human factor dynamics that start to play in. They are not the same every time you're shooting that approach into Aspen at night. And unfortunately, our little paradigm worlds, our little filtered worlds can get us in trouble. And that's why, especially as a flight instructor and a student, you have to be cognizant of the fact that you may not like your student and your student may not like you for whatever reason, but you have to identify that and figure out how to work with each other. If you're in a crew aircraft, you have to work through those issues because if those barriers build up, you're going to have a long flight, especially if something goes wrong because you're going to depend on each other. You should have a tacit trust. And unfortunately, these are the kinds of barriers that have a detriment to the outcome, a successful outcome. We talk about distractions, complacency, self-induced pressure. If you look at this particular sign, you see what's written on the sign. It's kind of funny. It gives you some information about why the traffic is backed up. But guess what? That creates distractions for everybody that's reading that sign and who's laughing because they're going to jam on their brakes and the person behind them is going to hit them. When you think about distractions, you think about complacency and self-induced pressure, little things like that, miscommunication. These are cascading events. These are not one-offs. These are not isolated. So remember, if you've had one distraction, you're going to have multiple distractions because your mind isn't where it needs to be. You're thinking about too many things. You're analyzing too many things. You're trying to pull in too much information. We talk about information overload, especially with all of the automated cockpits that we're flying. That can be a distraction in and of itself because it's too much information to process. And let me just give you an example. Just think about the active taxi from the ramp to the active runway. Think about all the things that you're thinking about just during that short period of time. And let me just give you an example. So I started to write down all the little things that I think I'm thinking about and I made a list. Well, this is only one of about 10 slides. I'm not going to give you the 10 slides. But when you start reading some of these elements, you know, they look very methodical, you know, very systematic. That's not how your brain works, not in any way, shape or form. In fact, your brain works like this. It's all over the place. And when you look at it, you'll be thinking about aviation stuff. And then all of a sudden, right in the middle of all this aviation stuff, this little random thought comes through your brain. Did I lock the car doors? 
Where did that thought come from? I was thinking about airplane stuff, running checklist, and then all of a sudden this thought of, did I lock the car doors? So then you focus and you get back to doing aviation stuff, mm-hmm. and another random thought comes through. Where am I going to go party? And after I get to destination, your brain is constantly thinking about a lot of things. It doesn't compartmentalize and say, okay, I'm in the airplane, therefore I'm not going to think about anything else. And if you get an opportunity, the best example of what I'm talking about is go to the NTSB website and pull up the report for the Comair 5191 accident in Kentucky. That is an outstanding textbook case of how these pilots started their day off wrong on the wrong airplane. And between the time they left that ramp and the time they tried to take off, this is what was happening. They were doing airplane stuff. They were talking about other people who were flying for other airlines, their friends that were getting jobs. They did a little more airplane stuff. They passed by the runway they should have been on to get on a dark runway that had no lights on it. And then they tried to take off. And then they ran out of runway and tried to make the airplane fly. It's a textbook example of exactly what I'm talking about here. Of course, then we have the other side of the coin, and that is we have, I call him the Captain Courageous. I can make it happen. I'm going to accomplish the mission. Why? Because I am Captain Courageous. Ladies, hold my beer, watch this. I can make this airplane dance. We talk about overconfidence, putting the airplane or yourself in a position that you shouldn't be in. A lot of things that I'm seeing, especially in general aviation, is pilots that have minimal skills. That is, they may have two, three, four, five hundred hours, even into the early thousands of hours. What they particularly lack in skills, abilities, and knowledge, they will um, transfer that confidence into an airplane. You have an autopilot. You have TAWS. You have weather. You have a GPS. And as long as you can program all that stuff and hit execute, I'm good to go. So even though I may not have the flying skills or be able to operate confidently in IFR conditions, I got an airplane that can. I have a job, and I've unfortunately looked at a lot of accidents where pilots have had that kind of mentality, and it didn't end well for them and their passengers. And these are the kinds of things that you have to be cognizant of. And a great document for you to read is the advisory circular put out by your FAA. It's free. It's AC 60-22, all about aeronautical decision-making. Not only is it a great tool for aviation, it's a great tool for life lessons. I've used some of these on my son, who is now in college, but you can pick up a lot of good information out of this advisory circular and apply them to everyday things that you do in life other than fly. So I would recommend that you get it. Of course, now you have to apply it. If you look at this particular airplane and you look at this particular picture, it looks like the prop is bent. Well, that's actually the parallax from the camera picture that someone took. If you look at the canopy cover, it's all rippled. That's because the engine is running. The canopy covers on the airplane. The airplane's tied down. This particular pilot had just bought a new Garmin 530, had it installed, and he decided that he was going to practice programming it in the airplane, but he didn't want to kill his battery. So he started the aircraft, and of course, he can't see out the window. Now, this is at a small airport in Maryland, and of course, the ramps are always busy. You have people that are not only aviation-oriented or inclined, but not aviation-oriented. You have kids running around, things like that. They may not see that spinning prop. This is a detriment to aviation safety. The question is, why would a pilot or somebody that calls himself a pilot put them and others in a position of jeopardy by doing something like this? It's a hard question to answer, but it has to be a retrospective thing that, you know what, this was not the wisest thing. Somebody needed to counsel him, and in fact, they did. When you look at this particular accident, of course, it kind of looks obvious Um, If you look at the position of the aircraft, it's it's evident that it was a stall of some sort, probably at a low altitude. And if you look at the direction of the aircraft itself, and of course, you look at the direction of the fire and the smoke and it's blowing, you can put the scenario together that, yes, this pilot took off downwind and it didn't end well. Well, that's only part of the problem. This pilot didn't do a pre-flight before he left uh, left the ramp, taking off on a short runway. And, of course, 
there is at a point on the runway where you make a decision, especially if you don't have an, an operational airspeed indicator. Do I continue to fly the airplane or do I abort this takeoff? Well, the pilot got into that particular question and tried to make the airplane fly, lost the airplane, stalled it, and crashed right off the end of the runway. And the reason for it, yes, he lost control. Yes, he didn't operate it as he should. But really, the primary reason started with the pre-flight. If you look at that pitot tube, the pitot tube cover was still on it. That presents a problem. So when you start shortcutting the process, not going through the checklist, not doing the things that you as a pilot and commander are responsible for, bad things can happen like this particular accident. One of the things that the NTSB is looking at as well as the FAA is this thing called professionalism. And I'm going to let you just read this real quick. This is from the now chairman of the NTSB who is leaving at the end of June. Uh, He's turned in his resignation and he'll be leaving at the end of June. But he came up with this particular definition, his definition of professionalism, and it does have some good characteristics in it. Now, where's the expectation? Well, I'm just a general aviation pilot. I just fly on the weekends. I fly my Piper Cub. I don't need to have, quote, professionalism. But there are qualities of professionalism that every pilot should have, whether you're a student pilot, all the way up through the commercial professional pilot. And uh, again, we, we slam that door. We catch that in the 30 micron filter. I don't need to professional be professional because I don't fly, but on the weekends. Well, you have to have a professional attitude because that's what gives you the mindset to do the right thing, even when no one's looking. And when you start looking at this, the FAA sets technical standards. They do not regulate professionalism. However, The FAA expects you to operate with levels of professionalism or at least the characteristics of it. And of course, if you look at the NTSB and some of the new reports that are coming out in the last 10 years, professionalism is coming up. It's cropping up in these narratives and the probable cause because it is the characteristics of professionalism, the expectations that investigative authorities and regulatory authorities have of you as a pilot, a mechanic, or an aviation-related manager. So the question is, will professionalism really prevent this? This was a mid-air collision that occurred out here back in the 80s between a, um, a, uh, at that time it was a commuter airline, they hadn't been called regionals yet, a commuter airline and a Cessna 206 that was climbing to drop skydivers over Fort Collins, Lovell in Colorado. It was a brand new pilot to skydiving operation in the 206. Um, didn't understand ATC procedures, notifying them 30 minutes before they were going to do uh, the drop. He circle climbed. He was in controlled airspace, didn't have the proper transponder code. And these two aircraft met over the airport or in general proximity of the airport. And fortunately, um, the commuter airplane ran right through the uh, 206, cut the tail of the aircraft off of the five people on board. Everybody had a parachute on. As the aircraft bunted over, everybody got thrown out of the aircraft, but the person sitting in the back was struck by a propeller. The fact is, is that when you start dissecting the sequence of events, this accident started well before the aircraft and the pilot ever left the airport. These are the sequence of events. Professionalism, does it require the highest levels of operational discipline? Absolutely. At all levels, absolutely. Whether you're a student pilot or an ATP or a a CFI. The fact is, is that you have to have operational discipline all the time. This was a Cessna 421 flown by a very famous world balloon pilot, Ben Abruzzo. He was taking his wife and four of her girlfriends to Aspen in the 421, leaving New Mexico. He had had other people loading the aircraft for him. They put some skis and baggage in the nose Uh, baggage compartments. He didn't do a proper pre-flight walking around to ensure that everything was secure. Right at liftoff, the baggage door on the right side opened up. Now the parallax from the left seat made it look like the door and the prop would come together. So he turned, got the airplane back on downwind. He pulled the right engine or pulled the um, right engine back to flight idle, but he feathered the left propeller. He had zero thrust. He was at a low altitude. Airplane struck the ground. Everybody survived this accident. As catastrophic as it looks in these pictures, 
Everybody survived the accident. <clears throat> the aircraft caught fire. Unfortunately, he did not brief the passengers on how to exit the aircraft. There was a woman who was sitting right next to the clamshell door. All she had to do was pull the handle up to evacuate. They were all found in the front of the aircraft. Pre-flight briefings. We are responsible as pilot in command to brief all of our passengers, regardless of, the, of whether they're pilots or not. You have that responsibility. And you can see that here's the left propeller that's feathered. <clears throat> we talk about airmanship. Everybody has their own definition of airmanship. And some of the qualities, of course, of airmanship are attitude and experience and knowledge. Of course, interpersonal skills, and that is mental capabilities. Can you process large amounts of information quickly? Of course, natural and trained tactile skills. I know pilots that can make airplanes dance, but they're lousy decision makers. But they are very good stick and rudder pilots. And then, of course, um, self-awareness and self-discipline. Doing the right thing. Of course, when nobody's looking, but doing the right thing all the time and don't shortcut. And then the last quality, of course, is luck. We all know those pilots that have a little bit of luck all the time. They've been involved in situations where somebody else would have been killed. They seem to have skated. So, I mean, you have your own definition of airmanship, but these are the kinds of things that you should be thinking about. Airmanship doesn't start when you get to the airport, pull the airplane out of the hangar, or get in the airplane and fly away. It starts well before you even get there. And that, like safety, has got to be a core value because there are qualities of airmanship that apply to life. Pink and punk, <clears throat> procedural, intentional noncompliance, and unintentional noncompliance. We've all been here. And, and if you tell yourself that you haven't, you're lying to yourself. A procedural, intentional noncompliance is not following the FARs, not doing what needed to be done, like doing a pre-flight, consciously not doing things. They're usually premeditated acts. That is, I don't need to do a pre-flight because I've already done it three flights ago. The airplane is still good to go. Well, you just refueled it again. You should be doing a pre-flight. An unintentional noncompliance is a distraction, a mistake. Air traffic control calls you, you missed the call. You didn't intend not to answer it. You just missed it because something got your attention and you didn't hear them calling your airplane. Or if you rent multiple airplanes, you didn't recognize the end number. That happens a lot. So when you look at a pink and a punk, in a pink, an intentional noncompliance, you go to training. You do all the things that you have to do to go to training and satisfy the instructor, satisfy the examiner like Karen. You do it. You do it by the book. Everything is good to go. The problem is when you return to your own environment where nobody's watching, where you don't have the watchful eye of the company, the peer group, an examiner, and you fall back into bad habits. That's the issue. These are the intentional noncompliances. And as Karen was telling me, because she is a DPE, the, the pink event is one of those events where the FAA is coming after you and they're going to come after you hard. An unintentional noncompliance is more about the kinder, gentler FAA that will give you some counseling to tell you not to do it again. So why do we do it? Very simple. Reward, mission accomplishment, money if you're flying commercially, things like that. But we are mission-oriented, point A to point B. We do not like to fail and have to go to point C or not go at all. So it's about reward. High probability of success. Been there, done that. I've done it before. This is my home airport. I can make it happen. So you know what? I've squeaked down before when the weather was bad. I have a high probability of success. And like I said, usually the third time is a charm. And then, of course, no, no um, adverse reaction from your peer group. Your friends encourage you. Other pilots encourage you. If you're flying in a crewed airplane, your co-pilot or in the case of a captain, um, you know, you're not counseling each other, go, man, we probably shouldn't have done that or we shouldn't do that. Don't put ourselves in that position. There is no adverse reaction. And so that breeds bad behavior going forward. Let me give hey, you a Alex, few accidents. You know, go right, ahead. Yep. Just let me make a point here. Uh, as the audience is probably well aware, we're about five minutes to the top of the hour. Uh, Greg certainly has more content to tell us. I think we're all finding this very fascinating and the backstories and uh, of, of these unfortunate accident scenes. Uh, so please stick with us. 
And uh, and again, I'm we'll right, be holding I'm, I'm questions. I'm getting close, Karen. I'm getting close. Okay. I just want to let people know we will be running just a little bit over. So uh, I think that we're all finding this very valuable. Thank you, Greg. Continue. Here's an accident, unfortunate, brand new flight instructor, 23 years old. He was told about, you know, the practice area. And in fact, he had actually been flying in this area as a student and getting his ratings. He becomes a flight instructor, takes his first student up on a, uh, on a more or less orientation flight. And they're doing stalls at 1,500 feet AGL. Company policy was no less than 3,000 feet AGL. Unfortunately, you see the outcome. The question is why? Knew what the standards were, were guidance or told about it. And did they just, did it, was it an intentional act? Was it premeditated or was it just an unfortunate act? Was he trying to show off to the student? Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you could factor into an accident like this. We will never know because unfortunately we do not have him to ask those questions of. But these are the kinds of things that you have to have that high level of operational discipline. And I was kind of surprised that a brand new flight instructor would, would do what this particular instructor did. But then when you start talking to people that knew him, it was kind of like, yeah, he was a risk taker. He was a little overconfident in his skills, abilities, knowledge. And then all of a sudden, the big picture starts to come together. We talk about currency, especially IFR currency. Currency and proficiency have two different in, uh, definitions. You can be instrument current and not instrument proficient. And there's a big difference between the two. And that's what happened in this particular instance. Here you had a pilot flying a Cessna 210 who was instrument current, but was not instrument proficient. And going into Salt Lake City started his letdown two miles too soon and unfortunately struck a, uh, the vertical cliff of a mountain and killed all six people on board. And again, it is all about operational discipline. If you haven't flown instruments in a while, your ego should not get in the way. Go get a flight instructor. Go out there and get a couple of hours of reorientation. Why? You got to get your head back in the game. You've got to get that mindset back. It's all about character. It's all about accountability, integrity, and responsibility, being the most responsible pilot in these conditions. What you're looking at is a shot taken straight up of a 1,200-foot TV antenna where you can only see about the bottom fourth of that antenna. It's up into the scud. This is the airplane that struck it. It was a Cessna 182. The pilot was a brand new corporate pilot. He was 24, 25 years old, got his first, quote, corporate job flying for a uh, farm uh, equipment company. The, bo the boss had to go 50 miles. That's all, just 50 miles to go look at some equipment. And the weather was lousy. Rather than tell the boss they can't go, he tried to make it happen. Unfortunately, they lost their life by three feet. You can see where the wire struck the outboard portion of the wing and killed both occupants. Three feet is all it took between life and death. Again, it's about the decisions. This particular event was an old Republic uh, Convair 580. <clears throat> when we have these unexpected things, um, of course, you have to start dissecting, of course, the sequence of events. What you're looking at in the middle of the upper part of this picture is a hole in the windshield. That hole is that hole. It was a two-pound duck that came through that window. It's an inch and a half thick piece of pressurized glass at uh, 160 knots on approach going into Sioux Falls, South Dakota at night. <clears throat> Captain was the flying pilot. They, uh, <clears throat> they left the gate a little late, and as they were approaching uh, Sioux Falls, they, uh, the duck came through the window, struck the captain square in the face, disabled him. Um, it looked like a bomb had gone off in that cockpit. The first officer had enough presence of mind to get the airplane on the ground safely. When you think about it, you listen to the cockpit voice recorder, the flight attendant had come up during the course of them running their checklist. She interrupted the checklist to give them a passenger count and said, see you on the other side. When the crew resumed the checklist, they missed one item on that checklist. And it was a very critical item. It was windshield heat. Because when the airplane went up to altitude, it was in the wintertime, it was cold soaked. The window got cold soaked. And with the window not being tempered by the windshield heat, when that duck struck it, it shattered it and blew it up just like this. We see this all the time, especially as general aviation pilots. 
You have the line guy who comes up, wants to know how much fuel. You have passengers in the back that are asking you a bunch of different questions while you're trying to talk to ATC, copy a clearance, or even run a checklist because you're by yourself doing multiple things. You have got to slow the process down, take that deep breath, put up some barriers, give some guidance to your passengers that there are going to be sterile cockpit points, whether you're single pilot in a Cessna 182 or other aircraft. These are the things I need to do as a pilot for our safety. I will talk to you when I'm done, and I will let you know that. You have to be the responsible, operationally disciplined pilot. Let me just finish this up by saying that aviation safety, we have to be both proactive and reactive. We are, of course, learning from accidents and incidents. We have all of these hangar flying sessions. We have great sessions through Mentor Live programs like us. But we also have to continually go out and take the time and the effort to learn. You cannot shut down and think that you know it all. Trust me, as an acts investigator, I am constantly learning something new or refreshing myself every single day because I have to dissect the performance of pilots who have put themselves in peril. And I have to uh, try to understand why so we can prevent it from happening again. Just remember, flying is a skill. Anybody can learn to fly. I can teach somebody to fly in five minutes. That's not the point. It's all about having the appropriate safety attitude because that's what it is. It's an attitude. So my, my, uh, my preaching to you is you practice with purpose. Every time you go out, I don't care if it's recurrent training, you never look at it as, yeah, I just got to go out and do recurrent training to fill the box or satisfy my employer so I can continue to fly. You should make it a point that every time you go to training, you learn something new, at least two things new, whether it's about the airplane, whether it's about your flying, maneuvering, new things every single time. Make that training worthwhile because you want to practice with purpose so that you can execute with purpose. You don't want to just be executing without understanding why and what you're doing in the execution of remedial action or challenging events that are going to acquire all of your skills, abilities, and knowledge. Finally, one of the things that uh, that I preach all the time is the FAA has their own version of ADM. Of course, that's aeronautical decision-making. This is Greg Bice, ADM, attitude, discipline, and motivation. You have to have that positive attitude all the time. You have to operate at 100% or greater. If you have a 70% attitude, you're going to have a 70% outcome. So you have to have that 100% attitude. You have to have the discipline to have that attitude. Some of us are very self-disciplined. Others need to have a little bit of help in having that self-discipline. That's not a bad thing. That's just a characteristic. But the fact is, is if you can exercise that discipline to have the attitude, you're two-thirds of the way there. And then, of course, motivation. Some of us are very motivated, self-motivated. Others need a little bit of a kick in the behind to be motivated. But without motivation, you will not have the discipline. Without motivation, you will not have the, the attitude. So this is my version of ADM. I preach it. It's on my business cards. It is part of my persona, ADM. And it applies to all sorts of things in your regular life as well. And then wrapping up, we are all, I believe, all mentors. We all have a hundred foot circle of influence. You don't know who is watching your every move, listening to your every word. I get feedback because I'm on TV quite a bit. I'm doing presentations like this. I get the feedback, man, I learned so much from this and that. And that makes me feel good. I'm very humbled by it. But there are other people that will never give me that feedback, but they are acting as I'm acting as a mentor to them. I had several silent mentors when I was with the NTSB, three people there that I really looked up to. I really liked various qualities of those silent mentors. They never knew they were mentoring me throughout my career at the NTSB until I left when I told them. And one of the guys, I liked the way he was very organized very disciplined in running investigations. I liked another uh, investigator for the way they handled the politicians, the politics, and some of the media. 
And then there was another one that overall had great management skills for handling large aircraft accidents. I didn't want to be them, but I liked their qualities that I incorporated to be the best investigator I could be. You don't know who you're influencing. You don't know who you're mentoring. So you have to pick and choose your words carefully. You have to demonstrate that you belong in the left seat or the right seat of that airplane as the pilot in command every single day. Because people are putting tacit trust that you as the pilot are going to do things the right way, even when nobody's looking. Because this is my bottom line. Leave me on vacation. I do not want to go out and look at any more airplane accidents. I've had a career full. I would love to have everybody put me out of a job. I appreciate the fact that you stayed with us. If you are still here with us, I overran my time. I try to give you a lot of information. And I know that Karen has talked about some questions. So I will stay and answer some questions that Karen may have received. Um, but again, thank you very much for your participation in this Mentor Live coming on and watching us talk about safety and what it means, not to just me and not to just you, but to all of us, because we are part of this aviation safety collective. Karen. Thank you, Greg. Obviously, you're a passionate believer in aviation safety. And I think you've said a lot of things that we're all taking to heart. I think especially as flight instructors, the idea that we are role modeling all the time, whether or not we're in the cockpit, at the FBO, anywhere, we are role models for behavior and people are aware of that and we can't just talk the talk. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Let's get on to these questions and comments. So earlier in your presentation, Earl commented, you can't really teach rich risk management. Debrief during training, explain the risk that was missed. Would you like to uh, give us your perspective on that, Greg? When you look at risk management, Again, yes, I mean, there are so many elements of what risk management is, and every individual defines risk management differently. Some have, you know, they're very risk adverse, some are very risk tolerant. And you have to find that medium, and a lot of it is introspective. If you're looking at it as an individual pilot who owns their own aircraft or operates aircraft for their own personal pleasure or business, you have to look at those qualities that you have, those skills, abilities, and knowledge that you possess, and you have to set those risk management boundaries. I know guys, I know friends of mine who are very competent instrument pilots, but they've set their own minimums, and it's usually 100 above what the required minimums are by the FAA. That's just their minimum. They understand their ego is not going to allow them to put that airplane into a position of jeopardy. So they will set their own standards when they're flying in that kind of environment. But again, risk management is a very nebulous term. You can't just lay out all of these qualities and expect that we're all going to follow them and apply them. So it's really about sitting down and putting your ego aside and determining what you're willing to at least, you don't want to be risk adverse, but you don't want to be risk tolerant. You want to split that difference. Where are you going to go? How far are you going to go before you say, I'm not going any further? I'm not going to go flying today. I'll wait till things get better. Um, things like that. Okay. Thank you, Greg. And um, we really appreciate the point that you, that you talked about consistency and that character of doing the right thing all the time, not only when people are looking. And I really appreciate your perspective on personal minimums because – uh, that is one of the things that comes out in every examination, discussions with the applicants about their personal minimums, and hopefully all GA pilots, all pilots have established those and written them down and comply with them. Not, you know, saying it's close. Yeah. It's enough. That's a yeah. slippery slope, isn't it? Okay. A uh, question from Art. So Art asks, can't flying schools actually define their working areas with GPS so students can stay better oriented to the location for maneuvers. Also, there is an app for phone lines to help maneuvering helicopters. Yes, um, I know several flight schools that have defined the boundaries. 
of their training boxes so that they, they will stay within those training boxes. Um, I have a friend of mine that owns a helicopter flight school here at uh, Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport, and they have very defined boxes in the areas that they do flight training in. They use uh, GPS trackers so that the instructor can actually track on the phone this app and they can stay within the box. And then, of course, the guy on the ground, their dispatcher, can actually track and see where the aircraft is actually operating as well. So there is technology out there. Of course, there is technology through the four flights and, and the X-wings and things like that where you can set up boundaries on a, on a uh, moving map display as well. And, and so we have the technology. It's a matter of understanding how it can benefit you in a training environment. Yeah, clearly for flight for flight instructors in flight schools, one of the big benefits of ADSB out and any type of uh, GPS and all the apps we have is it's very, very simple to track a student who's out on a solo. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very early heads on heads up if they're running into some kind of issues or if they're following the flight plan. And uh, there's no cheating, if you will. They really need to do what they said they were going to do. <laughs> And in fact, for flight and, and a number of these other programs have uh, breadcrumbs. They're basically a poor man's flight data recorder, which is a great debriefing tool for both flight instructors. Or if you have a student out on a solo, you can debrief off of their data, which I think is a great idea because you can say, yeah, you weren't tracking very well. You weren't following your course lines very well, or you straight out of the uh, out of the training box. Uh, actually, I utilize that to debrief uh, check rides. It's very yep. helpful. Yeah. A uh, friend gave us gave you a positive thumbs up. He said it's this been one of the most thought provoking presentations he has ever seen or heard. And well, Randy, yes, thank you, Fred, on awesome. behalf of Greg. Yeah. And uh, Randy asks, what is your opinion on a pilot's humility? You know that <laughs> that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we all hope that as pilots, yes, we all have a bit of an ego because we can do things that the majority of the population here in the United States, as well as around the rest of the world, can't do. And that is fly in the freedom of the sky. As far as humility, that is a personal trait. That is a characteristic. You hope that your parents taught you to have a good heart and have humility. And, um, and you, you learn that I've tried to, as a parent, instill that as well as my wife instilling that in our son. But when it comes to being humble, just remember, this is aviation. I, I was told when I went to work for the NTSB, and this is one of the things that kicked me back to center. When I had one of my silent mentors tell me, son, I've been flying longer than you've been alive. I know so much more than you'll ever know. And all of a sudden that put it into perspective that, yeah, you can't wear that, you know, flight instructor badge on your chest with 1500 hours and think that you can, you know, out, outshine someone else. We are in this collective. We all are pilots. We've accomplished some, something that a lot of people have not or cannot accomplish. We should look at that as from a skills, abilities and knowledge perspective. We should be humbled by the fact that we are doing those kinds of things, but we are not in competition with our fellow aviators, not in any way, shape, or form. We preach it all the time in the safety business. Every airline has their own safety department, but when it comes to safety, there is no competition. You can compete for airfares and passengers and everything else, but if you talk to anybody in a safety department in an airline, they, they will always tell you, there is no competition amongst the airlines with safety. Very good point, Greg. I usually uh, like to tell students in training, learners in training now with the new terminology, if yes. you ever catch yourself thinking or saying, watch this, it usually means you're about to do something stupid. Yep. And, and with that, Karen, the other thing that I, I see and I, I try to talk about in these safety presentations is – if you have to think twice about doing something, you probably shouldn't do it. One, because it could be wrong, but two, and more likely, it's because you lack the self-confidence to actually do it. You have to be confident in everything you do when you execute with purpose. 
And if you start challenging yourself, well, maybe I should, or maybe I'll go a little further into this weather, or maybe I'll do that. As soon as you do that and start questioning yourself, you lack the confidence to execute with purpose.